There are three Carolina Bays aligned one after the other like a Catena crater chain near Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Three hits in a row. Pow! Boom! Bang! This presentation tries to determine their sequence of emplacement using the law of superposition and a method of direct measurement of the LiDAR images compared to an indirect method derived from a least squares fit of ellipses. Welcome to another edition of the Carolina Bay of the Day, where we study the secondary impacts made by the glacier ice boulders that were ejected by one or more extraterrestrial impacts on the Laurentide Ice Sheet by the Great Lakes. The secondary impacts produce seismic vibrations that liquefied unconsolidated soil, and the oblique impacts of glacier ice on viscous ground created inclined conical cavities that became shallow elliptical basins by viscous relaxation. The fact that well-preserved Carolina Bays have elliptical geometry is evidence that these geological features originated as inclined conical cavities, as can be demonstrated by experiments. Today we will examine three Carolina Bays known as the Carroll Road Bays. These geological features are located about 84 kilometers or 52 miles northwest of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The basin, labeled A, is at an elevation of 34 meters above sea level, and basins B and C are at 33 meters above sea level. The topography of this LiDAR image represents these elevations with different colors. The rim of basin B over basin C is very faint, but from the law of superposition, we can deduce that basin C was in place before basin B. Basins A and B do not overlap, so their relative time of emplacement cannot be determined from geological morphology. This is a satellite image of the same area. It is difficult to see the Carolina Bays. LiDAR, which is a laser-based ranging technology, is essential for the study of the Carolina Bays. The description of the video has a link to the LiDAR visualization tool for Google Earth by Michael Davias. When you measure the width or the length of a Carolina Bay with the ruler tool in Google Earth, you don't really know if the endpoints that you are choosing are the best ones. There is no way to know if the line that you have drawn is truly the major axis or the minor axis of the ellipse. An error of a few pixels on the image can represent a substantial distance in meters. Using this manual method, the width and length of basin A measure 546 and 923 meters respectively, as illustrated in these images. The northwest rim of basin C was completely covered by the emplacement of basin B. This creates great uncertainty about the length of basin C. The left image illustrates a manual measurement using the Google Earth ruler that shows a length of 598 meters for what appears to be the inner dimension of the bay. The image on the right shows a length of 667 meters using the templates provided by the LiDAR visualization tool by Michael Davias. In order to obtain the measurements based on the least squares fit, we need to identify the points where the margins of the Carolina Bays are unambiguous. The small circles represent the sample points. Notice that no points are indicated where Basin B touches Basin A and where Basin B intersects with Basin C. Also, the northeast part of Basin C has been destroyed by modern construction and no sample points were taken at that location. Each sample point provides a set of coordinates. The options in Google Earth are set to provide latitude and longitude of each point in decimal notation for input into a Python program. Processing the points with a least squares algorithm for fitting an ellipse provides an image that shows how the points relate to the best fitting ellipse. The program that displays the ellipse also provides the length of the major and minor axis in meters. Application of the least squares fit confirms the elliptical geometry of the three Carolina bays and provides the width and length of each ellipse. These measurements are better than the single measurements obtained by using the ruler in Google Earth because they are derived from the complete geometry of the bay from a multitude of points. This image shows the ellipses produced by the least squares method overlaid on the LiDAR image of the three impact basins. It is important to determine the reasons why single measurements using the ruler in Google Earth can be wrong. In the case of the basin labeled A, one of the points is significantly inside the elliptical curve. Although the point on the LiDAR image seems to be at the rim of the bay, the least squares fitting of the ellipse indicates that the point is not where it should be. A satellite image reveals the reason why the point is displaced from the elliptical curve. A farm field along Highway 917 has reclaimed some soil along the rim of the bay, and the displacement of the rim makes the bay seem smaller on the LiDAR image. Using the least squares method, it is not important that one point is out of place. The overall geometry of the ellipse determines its width and its length, which correspond to the minor and major axis of the ellipse. 
Based on an experimental model, the glacier ice boulders that made these Carolina bays had diameters of one-fifth of the bay length. The width-to-length ratio of the ellipses corresponds to the trigonometric sine of the angle of impact. These bays are aligned toward Lake Michigan, which is the convergence point of many Carolina bays. The distance to Lake Michigan provides the flight distance, and all this information is sufficient to calculate the trajectory of the ice projectiles and their energy. This table was calculated using the widths and lengths obtained by manual measurements with a ruler tool from Google Earth. The results reveal an inconsistency. The time of flight for the creation of the basin labeled C is 35 seconds greater than for basin B. This means that Basin C could have been created after Basin B, which contradicts the geological observation that Basin B overlaps Basin C and that Basin C should have been emplaced before B. We can revise the calculations using the widths and lengths obtained by the least squares method. The most striking difference is the length of Basin C, which is almost 100 meters more than what was measured with the Google Earth ruler. The times of flight calculated using the measurements from the least squares fitting procedure show that the impact basin labeled C was made 12 seconds before basin B. This is consistent with the sequence of emplacement that we can determine from the law of superposition. Basins A and B were made almost contemporaneously, but they do not overlap. The impacts that made these Carolina bays were very powerful. The kinetic energy for the formation of basin A was equivalent to 4.5 megatons of TNT. Basin B and Basin C were both in the 2 megaton range. Each of these impacts created seismic vibrations of magnitude 7.7 .7 and above. The strong tremors of these impacts liquefied on consolidated soil and speeded up viscous relaxation that transformed the inclined conical cavities into shallow depressions. Application of the least squares method for fitting ellipses to Carolina bays provides a more objective method of determining the dimensions of the bays for forensic analysis. The method is particularly suitable for dealing with overlapping Carolina bays, as demonstrated in this example. Thank you for joining me in the investigation of the Carolina bays and the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. I will continue to examine the Carolina bays one bay at a time. My book about the Carolina bays is available at Amazon. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel to be notified of future videos about the Carolina bays.